In this video, we'll be talking about how to sell and how to make valuable your Amazon or e-commerce business. Our guest, Ben Leonard from Ecom Brokers, he will share with us why you would want to sell your e-commerce business, how you could sell it, when to sell it, and maybe how not to sell it. And um, you will get all these tips in the presentation shortly. And before that, I want to inform you that this session is sponsored by three companies, Awesome, Zonguru, and Getida. Getida is a Amazon FBA audit and reimbursement solution for Amazon sellers. They can help you to get your money back from Amazon. Check their offer and the link below in the description. Also, Zonguru is an all-in-one suite for Amazon sellers, suitable at any stage of Amazon journey. Again, the offer and the link in the description. And finally, Awesome is a FBA aggregator created by ex-Amazonians for Amazon sellers, and they are acquiring Amazon brands. And if you want to sell your brand, talk to them. Maybe they will buy your brand. <laughs> so the link below and the contacts are in the description as well. And uh, in this session, you will also meet Lisa Lees. She works with different Amazon brands and hosts Orange Click videos. And finally, please like and subscribe. Don't click this button, but uh, any thumbs up buttons below. It helps us and you. All right, so now let's jump to our speaker. Let's get ready for Ben Leonard at the Clickbox Summit. Yeah. Hi, Ben. How are you doing? Hey, I'm great. Thanks uh, so much for having me. Perfect. So, Ben, before we go to, to your today's presentation, could you share us a little bit about your background and also tell us how Ecom Brokers usually helps Amazon sellers? Sure. Um, I got into e-commerce in 2016, early 2016. Before that, my background is science. I'm a trained ecologist. I was working uh, in the oil industry, helping companies to get greener. Um, I'm a bit of a, uh, an eco-warrior in that way. I got into e-commerce by accident um, because I got quite sick and I had to take some time off work and, and some time away from my fitness hobbies. And so I decided to start a brand of fitness equipment as a hobby. And whilst I recovered, I ran that business and I, I became very good at it. I quit my job. I grew it over three and a half years and I sold it in late 2019 when we were doing about six million dollars in revenue. Uh, that business is called Beast Gear. It was actually purchased by Thrasio. It was their, I think it was their first British acquisition, second European acquisition, right before the explosion in mergers and acquisitions in e-commerce. And I sold it through a broker. And actually, the experience with that broker led to my accountant and I deciding that we could actually do a better job and represent sellers better and also actually help buyers better. So Alison, my accountant with Beast Gear, she has an accountancy firm who looked after Beast Gear's accounts. She's got about 20 years mergers and acquisitions experience, and she's a specialist e-commerce accountant. And I, um, you know, I'm a brand builder. I know how to take a brand, develop it, make it into something valuable and then sell it. And so combining those two skill sets, we're able to offer more for sellers in terms of maximizing the value of their business, planning the exit, and then marketing it to a pool of the right buyers so they, they get the very best possible deal in terms of both price and deal structure. And what's quite important is I'm still building brands now. So I still have the current lived experience of understanding what it is like to be an e-commerce business owner and understanding the trials and tribulations that that brings. So that's me, and that's how I uh, ended up with Ecom Brokers. <laughs> Very cool. So can you really shortly tell us also what will you uh, present uh, today to us? Sure. Uh, we're going to talk about um, why you might want to sell your e-commerce business and why even if you don't think you want to in the near future, you need to be planning about it already. How you can do that, how an e-commerce business is valued, and the ways in which you might not want to sell it as well. And uh, those things will be really valuable. And there'll be a lot of actionable things that people can take away. Okay. We always love actionable things. And we know you're ready to share your knowledge with us as well. So let's go ahead and, and see your presentation then. Sure. Let's do it. All right. So selling your e-commerce business, making it sellable and valuable. So why might you want to sell your e-commerce business? Well, if you'll forgive me, <clears throat> that question is the wrong question. The question is, why do you want to make your e-commerce business sellable? Because ultimately, one day you're probably going to sell. 
even the people watching this saying, but I love my business. I don't want to sell it. You need to consider what would the situation be like in five years, 10 years, 15 years? Are you going to keep up with the ever-changing industry? Is there a possibility that one day you might just be fed, of, fed up of this or you just can't do this anymore? So you need to make your business sellable because it's quite likely that one day you will want to sell. So why might you want to sell? Maybe you need the money. That's okay. That's a good reason to sell, perhaps for a new project. Oftentimes, it's the new projects that are the most exciting. And we might be fed up of our existing brand. And we've had this new idea and we need money for it. So we sell our first business. Maybe you want to sail around the world. It's quite unlikely, but we're actually working with a client right now who's just bought a yacht and he wants to sail around the world. Or maybe you want to live a life of leisure. I think that would be kind of boring, but for some people, that's why they want the money. Or maybe you're aware that your business has almost peaked. You're growing, but you haven't maxed out growth yet. And so you recognize that now would be a really good time to think about planning the exit. Maybe it's just time to move on, right? You no longer have the inclination, the time or the energy and get up and go or the passion for your brand. And it's time to give it to someone who does. And maybe you don't have the resources to take it where it deserves to go and another organization might. Maybe you recognize that your business is in demand. It's a great brand and you could get a lot of money for it. So what happens if you don't sell? Because of course you don't have to sell. Well, it might go great until one day you realize you can't or you don't want to do this anymore. And that's absolutely fine if your business is sellable at that point. But if you've never thought about selling until that point, you now have to go through the trials and tribulations of making it sellable. Maybe you're going a downwards trend until it fizzles out and you get nothing. And that would be a real shame because you haven't planned it properly. So you can't just wake up one day and decide you're going to sell immediately. But you can wake up soon, now, and decide to prepare for when that day comes, whether you know when that day is going to be or whether you just know that one day that's what you'd like to do. And you can wake up and then decide to implement that plan that you have made to take your sellable business to market because it needs to be sellable, of course. So how do you make your business more sellable and valuable? Well, first of all, we need to think about timing. Your business needs to be growing but not maxed out. You want to leave some meat on the bone. The new owner of the business is going to want to take the growth you've experienced, accelerate it even further, and then exit themselves. And if there's no meat on the bone, no carrot on a stick, nothing there for them to take, then your business is probably still sellable, but not as valuable and not as attractive to them. And you're going to want to reverse engineer the exit. You're going to want to find out what your business is worth now. Think about how much you want to sell it for or when you want to sell and reverse engineer that. So think about what are the things you need to do to get you there. The next thing to consider in terms of making your business more sellable and valuable is stability. How stable is your business? What do I mean by that? Well, there's lots of things that contribute to stability. <clears throat> are you selling in a risky niche? A niche in which potential owners are not too keen to get into because of all the liability risks that come along with it. For instance, some supplements or other consumables. Have you ever taken part in any gray area or black hat strategies? That affects the risk associated with your business, which some people just don't want to take on. What about the growth history and the potential? Have you got a great upward trend in your profits and sales? Or have you plateaued? Or worse, are you declining? How transferable is your business? Can you just hand it over? A good way to think about that is if you fell down the stairs tomorrow and broke your leg and had to go to hospital, would your business run without you? If the answer is yes, then you have a pretty transferable business. That's great. If the answer is no, then the same thing applies to when it comes to selling it. It's not very transferable, unfortunately. And you have some work to do to make it transferable. And what really helps with that transferability is the right documentation. So that's everything from your accounts. Are your accounts all in order? You wouldn't believe the brands we look at, which, you know, on the face of it, they're great, wonderful products, great reviews, listings are amazing, social media is beautiful, but their accounts are a complete mess. And that's actually a dream for a potential buyer because it means they can pull the wool over your eyes and take your business from you for as little as they possibly can. Is your intellectual property in order? Have you got your trademarks, patents, design registrations organized in not the countries, not just the countries you're selling in, but the countries you're manufacturing in too? And what about your SOPs? Have you got systems and processes that can easily be absorbed by the new owner? Is your business profitable? Now, no, a business doesn't have to be profitable to be sold, but in e-commerce, physical products, brands, which is what we're talking about here, generally speaking, your business does need to be profitable. And is your business defensible? Are you just selling random stuff on Amazon, for example? 
Or have you got a legitimate protected brand with intellectual property? Have you built a suite of products which solve related problems for a particular group of people, whether that's knitters or motorcycle fans, right? That's when you have a real defensible brand and that's really attractive, sellable and valuable. So let's talk about <clears throat> how we value e-commerce business. Basically, you might have heard this on podcasts already or read blogs about it. We're going to multiply the trailing 12 month performance by a multiple. So I'm going to explain to you both what I mean by performance and what I mean by multiple. Now, it's important that I note that it's not always a trailing 12 month period. Sometimes for particular reasons, we might use just the last six months, or maybe it's a very young business and younger and younger businesses are now being sold. and We don't even have 12 months of data. But for simplicity and for the purposes of, of today, we're going to talk about the trailing 12 months. So what do I mean by performance? <clears throat> we can measure the performance uh, using EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And this is usually done for businesses which are doing more than one and a half million dollars in revenue. Or we can use SDE, which is seller's discretional earnings, which is usually for smaller businesses doing less than a million. The caveat here, though, is oftentimes we actually do use SDE even for the larger deals in e-commerce, those doing more than one and a half million. So for simplicity, let me, let me break this down for you, okay? Your seller's discretionary earnings is equal to your net income plus addbacks plus adjustments. So now you're probably wondering, well, what are addbacks and adjustments? And I'll explain that for you in a moment. I'll explain it for you now, actually. So addbacks are things that we add back onto your profit and loss sheet. We take it out of the loss side, put it back on the profit side. So that can be things which the new owner is not going to have to pay for. Could be your payroll, health insurance, office, travel, consulting, software, phone, internet, intellectual property. Whereas adjustments, I'll get into more detail in a few minutes, but those are things, adjustments that we make where we recognize change in the, in the cogs and change in, in the profit and loss over the last 12 months. So the next stage is to take your seller's discretionary earnings and multiply it by the multiple. We'll talk about that in a moment, which will give us the price of the business. And that doesn't include the landed cost of sellable inventory on hand at the time of the deal. So add backs, I mentioned that a moment ago. We're going to get back into that. These are personal related discretionary expenses, your phone, your travel, your salary, health insurance, office costs. As I said, anything that the new owners are not going to have to pay for because they've got entire you know, they're absorbing your brand into their entire setup and these costs just aren't going to apply for them. So it's only fair that we remove them from the loss side of your P&L sheet because that's that's depressing the true value of your business. There are also one off costs that won't be repeated. So if you've just paid for a trademark, you now have the trademark. You're not going to pay for it again. The new owner is not going to pay for it again. We can add that back. If you've paid for video for a particular product, for instance, not going to do it again. New owner is not going to have to do it again. Going to add that back. And the same applies for things like photography. Adjustments are where we get a little deeper. Okay, this recognizes change in the PL, as I said a moment ago. So, for instance, COGS, profit, shipping method. Let me get into detail and talk about that. Suppose you have a product that performs really well for you. And three months ago, you negotiated a lower price with your supplier. So now for the last three months, it's been more profitable for you. And therefore, it's resulted in a higher SDE for you, but only for the last three months. It's therefore not fair if the new owner gets the benefit of that lower cost from the supplier, but it's only contributing three months worth of extra profit towards your SDE. And therefore only three months worth times that multiple towards the value of your business. So it's entirely reasonable and justified for us to actually go back for the full 12 months and alter your SDE as if every unit of that product that you had bought from your manufacturer in that time had been at the new lower price. Similarly, what about profit? So you might have a product which you increased the price on, say on Amazon or on your website or both. And when you increased the price, you did not see a drop in sales. Maybe sales stayed the same or even went up because perhaps customers view your product as being more premium now. Well, you're getting more profit, but you only did this three months ago. So it's not fair. The new owner is going to benefit from being able to sell the product at a higher price, but it's only contributing three months worth to your SDE. 
So again, same thing applies. We can reasonably go back and justifiably go back the full 12 months and extrapolate as if you had been selling it at that higher price for the whole time. Similarly, what if you've only recently, you know, six months ago or four months ago, you've recently hit a threshold where it became economically viable to ship your products by sea rather than air? Well, the new owner is gonna get the benefit of shipping by sea rather than air. So it's only reasonable that we adjust, adjust the cogs as if you had been shipping by sea the whole time. Doing these completely legitimate adjustments, which recognize the true value of the business to the new owner is a really great way that an expert can add value to your business. Let me give you an, a deeper example, right? Suppose you sell 50 units a day of a product. <clears throat> three months ago, you increased the price and now the profit on that product has increased by $2. So over 365 days, that's $36,500 in extra profit. If you're selling the business at a 4x multiple, that's almost 150 grand added to the value of the business on one product alone. You do that across several products. You also look into shipping method. You also look into the price you've negotiated with your suppliers. You can see how the right experts will add six or even seven figures to the value of your business just by properly analyzing what is the true value of this business to potential owner and not just simply looking at the trailing 12 months performance. Let's look at a couple other examples of how we get to a multiple because I've mentioned multiples, but some of you will be wondering, how do I know what is the multiple for my business going to be? In e-commerce at the moment, multiples are typically somewhere between two and even up to about seven. Okay. Generally speaking. All right. There are exceptions. Of course, there are always exceptions. But if your sales discretionary earnings, that's your net income plus addbacks and adjustments, is $100,000. You got a two year old business, reasonably diversified, it's growing. You're probably going to get between three and three and a half X. If your seller's discretionary earnings is $500,000 with massive off Amazon sales, lots of IP, massive growth, it's five years old, it could be between four and six X. So you can see that when you grow your business that little bit, bit bigger, you have stronger intellectual property. Remember, I spoke about the things that make your business more valuable. You've got off Amazon sales where you own the customer journey. You've got lots of growth there that's going to impress the potential owner. And of course, you've got that history. You can see that you're going to get a higher multiple. You apply that higher multiple to the higher SDE. And you can see it's compounding in two ways. Not only have you got a higher SDE, but you're not just taking that lower SDE and multiplying it by the same multiple. It's not just a case of, okay, great. Now I've got $500,000 multiplied by three to 3.5 X. It's now I've got $500,000 multiplied by four to six X. So there are, you know, these two things go hand in hand and synergistically really boost the value of your business in, in almost a compounding way. But it's really important. Some of you will be thinking, well, yeah, but how do I figure out my SDE? It's got to be calculated by a professional who will be an accountant and a mergers and acquisition ex expert, understands e-commerce and the market and what your multiple should be. Otherwise, you're going to be leaving six or even seven figures on the table and the buyer is going to be laughing at you because when you get your SDE calculated by a professional, that alone will pay for their fees multiple, multiple times over, especially when you consider the adjustments and the addbacks, which can inc you know, significantly increase your SDE by hundreds of thousands of dollars and add you know, six or seven figures to your business. Sometimes... Buyers will approach you, you know, they'll find your business on Amazon and it's, it's a good business and they'll say they want to, to buy it from you and they'll say, uh, deal with us directly. Don't, don't pay an expert. Don't, you know, avoid the broker fee. And what that really means is please don't work with an expert who will properly calculate your SDE and your ad backs because they know that when you do that, you're going to ask for more for your business quite rightly because you now know what it's truly worth. And that alone will pay for the fee of this expert who's going to do this for you multiple times over. A good broker should be doing this. So we've spoken about why you might sell. We've spoken about why or the things that make your business sellable. And we've spoken about how we value your business based on the SDE and the multiple. So how can you sell it? Well, I hinted there at one method, which is to sell directly to a potential owner. You could approach them or they could approach you. And oftentimes they approach you. What happens is they uh, will, they're scraping Amazon. So they're scraping Amazon and other platforms like Shopify to find e-commerce business owners and emailing you or contacting you, contacting you on LinkedIn potentially. Even if they're not actually interested in buying your business, they're just kind of cold outreaching basically everyone. 
And initially, this seems absolutely wonderful. I've been working on my business for several years, putting in my heart and soul, blood, sweat, and tears. I was up all night on the phone to sell a support last night, banging my head against a brick wall. And now somebody wants to give me quite a lot of money for my business. This is amazing. However, unfortunately, inevitably, you're going to end up with a lower price and terms and deal structure that suits the buyer, not you. And it's incredibly hard work to do it on your own as well, because you see, they'll dangle a carrot in front of you. They'll say, hey, we, we want to we wanna pay you a lot of money for your business. And it's probably more money than you maybe ever imagined that you would ever get, especially when you start, maybe you started this as a side hustle and it's, it's grown and it's become amazing. And it's incredibly tempting. But in reality, your business isn't worth that carrot that they're dangling in front of you. Your business is probably worth a whole sack of carrots. And the deal that you're going to get when you don't have people fighting your corner, you don't have the, a broker fighting your corner, and you don't have legal representation fighting your corner, is going to be very skewed in the favor of the, uh, the, 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 the new owner. So in response to this, right, in response to this problem, we've seen the emergence of flippers. So flippers and sort of generic listing sites, if you like. And initially, this can seem great. Uh, I won't sell direct. I'll list it on this site and these guys will help me uh, get more for my money. But ultimately, you still end up with a lower valuation because unfortunately, these guys are working at scale with, with tons and tons of business owners. And they they basically, they'll pull some reports from your Amazon account, and your website, and they'll slap a value on the business based on the average of what they've been selling businesses for lately. And unfortunately, they don't actually get into your business to deeply understand how it works and deeply understand the numbers and make those appropriate adjustments that I spoke about before to represent the true value of the business to the new owner. So you end up with a lower valuation. And unfortunately, their fees are, are for what you get, which is basically just being listed on an eBay of websites, um, the fees are pretty high. And unfortunately, because they're operating at scale and it's not a very bespoke service, the service tends to be pretty for, poor as well. And inevitably, you more or less end up working directly with the, with the potential buyer anyway. So in response to this poor model, we've seen the emergence of consultants. So these consultants can be quite tempting because they have really low fees, four or even 5%. But unfortunately, these guys tend not to do very much work either. They will typically forward an email to a list of 100 aggregators that they know saying, hey, we have this business for sale. And those who are interested will contact you. And again, you end up working relatively directly with the potential uh, new owner of the business. And these consultants are double dipping because they're taking a referral fee from the potential buyer or the successful buyer. So they're not working in your best interests because they kind of don't mind what you get for the business so long as they get their 50 grand from the, from the uh, aggregator. So that, that model isn't great. In response to those models, you can list your business on a marketplace. So these are absolutely wonderful, it seems, because they have no fees. They, they, uh, their main, their main marketing point, their main USP is they have no fees. Sellers don't pay a fee. The buyer pays the fee. Well, how do you think the buyer's funding that fee? They're knocking it off what they would have paid you for your business. And you're still on your own. You're still working directly with a potential new owner and the service is still poor. You see what the buyers want to do is buy your business for as little as they possibly can, which is fair enough. Business is business hold back a portion of it in something they call a stability payment and give you terms that are entirely suited to them and pray that you have no one else at the table, no competitive environment with uh, multiple uh, buyers, potential buyers bidding for your business. That's what they want. And they want to pray that you've had no one work with you to maximize the value of your business so that you don't have a true understanding of A, what your business is worth and B, what is a fair deal. And what's also to their advantage when you're working on your own or with one of these generic services is you're feeling very emotional. You know, it's a very emotional time selling your business. You know, you're, you're deeply bonded to your business. For some people, it feels like another child. And what you need is a buffer between you and them that helps you iron out that emotion, take a step back and a deep breath so that you end up with the deal you want, the time scale that you want and the structure that you want. And the best way to do that is to go through a qualified brokerage and go through a qualified service. 
and a proper process. And these people ideally need to be experts with lived experience on all sides. That means that they are e-commerce business owners, preferably with current lived experience of that. They understand mergers and acquisitions and they have the experience there. And they're also accountants, particularly accountants in e-commerce. And what's really important is that they work with you until you are ready, not the other way around. So if you talk, a red flag is if you're talking to anyone and they're saying, come with us right away, we'll sell your business within 30 days, money will be in your bank account. There shouldn't be any rush here. Sometimes, it, you know, you might want to do it reasonably quickly. That's great. But more haste, less speed. You need to be working with people who aren't going to flip your business, but are going to carefully sell your business, carefully work with you to understand it, maximize the value of it, position it properly, and market it to a pool of the right potential buyers when you're ready. And, you know, another way to determine if, if the people that you're working with are the right people is if it's clear that your business isn't ready or if you if, if they value your business and they tell you, you know, it's worth a million dollars, you say, ah, didn't really want to sell it for less than one and a half. They need to be working with you to get it there, either by giving you, uh, you know, a list of things to go away and do or actually, you know, mentoring you on that route to exit and playing the long game and being patient with you and being respectful with you until you're ready to sell. And also being realistic with you, because it could be the case that your business is never going to be one and a half worth one and a half million, or it could be that in the current environment, it might be better to sell now, right? So they need to be having candid conversations with you. They need to be working with you to get your business built to sell and ready for a buyer to analyze it, not just slapping it on their listing site. They need to be getting you up to speed on the due diligence before you've even been introduced to buyers so that you have a neat and tidy business with a ribbon on top that a buyer is going to be really impressed by. They need to be organizing and calculating the numbers and adding value. The work that they do cannot be just pulling dumps and reports from Amazon and pulling dumps and reports from Shopify, and Etsy, or wherever else you're selling. They need to be, the work that they do needs to be justifying their fee. They then need to position the business properly and presenting it to a pool of the right buyers. And that's not just aggregators. They need to be doing their homework so that they might be presenting your business to other private equity, family offices, competitors, competitors from other markets, you know, other international marketplaces who want to get a foothold where you are or potentially aren't, don't have much online or marketplace like Amazon experience yet and want to get a bit of a footprint there. Not just aggregators, right? That's incredibly lazy just to market to aggregators. I don't have a problem selling to aggregators. I sold my business to an aggregator. I work with the aggregators every day. They're great. They're nice people. But business is business. And it's important that the the broker you work with casts a wide net and doesn't just take the lazy option of firing an email out to, to a whole bunch of aggregators. And they need to help you to structure the deal to suit you. That's, that's really, really important. So planning ahead, because I've spoken a bit about how you may not want to sell in the, the near or medium term, and that's absolutely fine, but it's important that you do plan ahead. The worst thing that you can do is not plan for an eventual exit even if it's not currently on your agenda, right? You got to find out what your business is worth now and then reverse engineer the exit with suitably qualified experts. So, you know, for instance, if you're orienteering without a map and a compass, you're not going to get anywhere fast and you're probably going to get lost. But if you find out, right, my business is worth a million, my ideal exit or my magic number is a million and a half or two million, or, or my time scale is, you know, X, Y, Z, they will work with you to reverse engineer that and stack up what you need to do like dominoes and then knock them down in sequence to get you there. Constantly keeping a track of what is the business potentially worth in the current market and what is the state or the environment of the current market and having their finger on the pulse so they can constantly be having discussions with you about when you pull the trigger and take it to market. That's the number one mistake people make is not planning and then just Getting an offer, a cold offer, and going it alone or using using some generic service. You know, in our businesses, we all hire experts to help us. We, we hire PPC experts. We hire intellectual property attorneys for our trademarks. We hire lawyers to help us with any legal disputes. And yet people aren't doing it with their most valuable asset. They're falling for this trick of, oh, avoid the broker fee or avoid, avoid fees of M&A experts and come to us direct. And actually you end up 
with a deal that is really poor, you've given your business away for much less than it's actually worth. And oftentimes the contract, and we can talk about it in the Q&A if, if you like, uh, is, is, is really poor and you won't be protected uh, if the new owners don't operate your business properly. Because that's really key, right? Is selling it to the right buyer who actually has the chops to run the thing. Because a lot of people have raised a lot of money in this space and probably 80% of them are going to fail and, and don't actually have the operational chops to run your brand. So I hope you found that helpful and informative. And there's been some actionable things there for you to think about in terms of how to make your business more valuable and sellable. We touched on some of them, thinking about your, your intellectual property, your SOPs, getting your accounts in order, thinking about what is that magic number and getting your business valued now so that you can reverse engineer that. So there are various ways that you can get in touch with us. Uh, you can email me ben at ecombrokers.co.uk. You can visit our website, ecombrokers.co.uk. And if you add a slash ebook onto the end of that, you'll get a free ebook, which will tell you about how to prepare your business for sale. And when you mention um, the Clickbox Summit, you will get 10% off of our fees. We are in the UK, but we're working globally with clients all over the world. So we're here to help. Perfect. Thank you very much, Ben. And uh, I wanted to mention that this session is part of the Clickbox Summit and the Clickbox promotion. We have a package which we call Clickbox. And this package contains more than 20 different uh, offers and deals uh, from service providers and tools uh, for Amazon sellers. And Ben's offer is one of them. So Ben, could you shortly tell us about what's included yeah, sure. i share it now on the screen as well absolutely um so we'll have a, a free consultation with anyone and anyone who comes to us anyway will always do a free indicative valuation but then once we start deeply analyzing your business you know getting into the the back end of your your accounts whether that's zero or quickbooks and getting read-only access to wherever you're making sales whether that's amazon or shopify or anywhere else we do a lot of work to deeply understand the numbers and as I mentioned before, understand where we can make the appropriate addbacks and adjustments to maximize the value of your business. That's always free if you then sell with us. But if you choose not to sell and take some time, you know, sell later on in the future, you now have that reference point that I mentioned. We then fee $700 for that. We're going to waive that fee for anyone who gets the, uh, the Clickbox Summit box. Thank you very much. Perfect. So, yeah, all the links you you will find below in the description of this video clickbox link also uh, the link to ecom brokers ben's website and now we have few questions let's see so what kind of uh, margin is desirable for buyers of amazon businesses yeah so <clears throat> what's important to note here is that your net margin that you're getting in your accountancy reports, and hopefully you're getting accountancy reports and not doing this yourself. You know, outsourcing your accountancy straight off the bat is really, really, really important in my opinion. Is not necessarily the same as after a good broker has worked their magic and maximized the value of your business and maximized the SDE by making the appropriate adjustments and addbacks. So let me just say that. Generally speaking, the brokers are looking for north of twenty percent, but they, you know, they, 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 they will go lower for a, an ex, something that's quite exciting. Um, for instance, uh, something unique with some unique IP around it, for example, but typically north of 20% and obviously the more the merrier. Okay, next question. Is it difficult to start a new brand after selling a business that works well? So you are experience, experiencing yeah. that, right? Yeah, uh, actually it's easier. Um, here's why. After you've sold your first business, presuming you got good money for it, you now have two things. One is you have a, a safety net around you. So you're you, you know, you've, you've got much less pressure on you. You feel free to operate at your best self. And this is when you get the best ideas and you just generally work better. That's part A. Part B is this. You now have capital. So you can get into niches that other people couldn't. You know, when I started my first brand, I was sourcing jump ropes from China for three bucks. Now, my new brand, which is going to launch soon, I'm, I'm sourcing products for $30 a unit, which means that I'm playing in a sand pit or a sandbox where it's actually mostly just enormous corporations and i'm the only little guy that can tell a story and that's where you know i'm gonna win because i'm like a nimble little speedboat and those guys are the lumbering cruise ships that take half a day to turn around so when you have that money behind you after an exit you've got the capital to get into niches that you otherwise couldn't and not just spend it on the products of course but spend it on the marketing as well 
So actually, I think it's easier. Great. Another question. Should I rather start looking into selling my business during Q4 or should I wait until the new year? It's a good question. No? It's a great question. It's, it's never too soon to get a valuation and get a reference point as to where you are on the map. And then have an open dialogue with those experts, whether that's a broker or, or an, another M&A expert that you, that you already know throughout Q4. Um, after Q4 is behind you, of course, that's going to significantly boost your numbers. But nevertheless, that doesn't mean that, you know, we're selling, we, we're working with clients right now who, who actively want to sell during Q4. And that's absolutely fine because you can make the right appropriate adjustments and add backs and even forecasts to recognize the strength that the business would have got through Q4. So get a valuation now, see how you go through Q4 and then probably look to exit Q1 next year. Okay, so let me take some other questions. So what I need to do in order to make my business transferable? Yeah, I kind of touched on that during the uh, during the presentation. Um, it needs to be such that it doesn't rely on you. It can it can be built around you. You can be the driving force in the vision. You can even be the face of the brand. I was the face of the brand for my business. That's absolutely fine. But it, you know, it, if you are hospitalized for a week, will the business run itself? That's the question to ask yourself. So you need to have your all your documentation in place, your systems and processes that can easily be handed over to a new owner. Do you have a team who can do the day-to-day -day tasks on your behalf? What about automation? Automation really boosts the value of a business because it makes the business easier to run, which is very attractive for a potential new owner, and cheaper to run, which is attractive for a potential new owner. So all those things make your business more transferable. Okay, so I have uh, one question regarding the automation. So do you mean by using different automation tools to, let's say, pull data, analyze the data, or what do you mean exactly by that? For documentation, sorry? For automation. So oh, for example, to... sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, for example, perhaps you're using automated software to help you with your PPC, uh, or maybe you're using tools like Zapier or Integromat for pulling out reports and filing them uh, I used to, I, I, I still do use Integromat's my favorite of, of all those tools. Perhaps you're using chatbots uh, to help you with your marketing. Um, automated email marketing flows were huge for me. I, I drove 30% of Beast Gear's website sales through automated flows uh, through email marketing. And I intend to do that with my new brands. Now I do do it with my new brands. I'm doing it with e-com brokers. Um, so automation really adds value to a business. Okay, very good. Thanks for clarifying that. So we have one question here. How do you maximize the valuation as a broker, which I as seller cannot do when selling directly? Yeah, so when you're working with a broker, they need to be having the experience as an M&A expert and an accountant such that they can deeply understand and analyze the numbers and spot where they can add value in their adjustments. And it's very difficult to do that when you're selling directly because A, you don't necessarily have the expertise to do, to do that. And B, if it hasn't been done by a chartered accountant, it's much easier for the, the person on the other side of the negotiation to push back on that. Whereas if you have a chartered accountant demonstrating and reasonably justifying why these adjustments are appropriate, it's much harder for them to push back. And in addition, the broker you're working with should be connecting you with an excellent and experienced mergers and acquisitions attorney who's gonna help you push these things forward during the contract negotiation such that the contract is skewed more in your favor than in their favor. It's really difficult to do that on your own. Plus, you're trying to run the business on your own as well as sell it. And unless you're an expert in uh, accountancy, mergers and acquisitions, and you're a mergers and acquisitions attorney, you're going to struggle to do that on your own. Okay, very good. Augustus, did you want to ask any questions? I see one more is here from the audience. Price strategy in Q4. Should we increase the price than normal or to get sales or decrease? It's a little bit off topic. I don't know how it would yeah, affect. It's, it's slightly off topic, um, yeah. but we'll, uh, I'll have a go. <laughs> we'll talk about it. Um, it. It depends on your brand. It depends on your competitors. It depends on the vertical that you're in. Are we talking about on Amazon? Which countries are you operating in? Are we talking about on your website? Every situ situation is unique. In terms, of, in terms of what I would say is that top line is more important. Profit really matters, but top line is a bit more important when you're trying to accelerate that growth towards an exit. So provided it's not going to horribly eat into your margins, if that's what you're asking me, then I would be, uh, in, and you're not going to see such a, a drop in sales that it's actually going to do the opposite, but provided it's going to increase your top line whilst not 
terribly eating into your profit margins, then yes, increasing the price is not a terrible thing to do. Uh, but make sure you keep a close eye on it. All right, good. Uh, let's uh, wrap it up here. And uh, thank you again, Ben. Uh, everybody who is watching, you'll find the link to Clickbox and to Ben's website below in the description. And uh, if people want to get in touch with you, I will activate your slide with your contacts so they can contact you through sure. these Please websites. Do. Yeah. I'm on LinkedIn yeah. as well. I love to talk and chat and uh, I'm here to help. There's no hard sell. Please get in touch. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Actually, and, oh, yeah. actually if, 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 I, if I may interrupt, we actually do have one more question from our viewers. So okay, we sure. would appreciate if, if you could answer that as well. So uh, how do you recommend to build a brand on a competitive Amazon market? Yep. Uh, first of all, you need to make sure you're selling high quality products, which are as good as or preferably better than the competition. You cannot sell rubbish. You need to build a legitimate brand and not stuff. It needs to be a suite of products which solve related problems for a particular group of people. And it needs to be something that you are personally interested in. If you're selling, trying to sell, pro I've, I just bought a bonsai tree a couple of days ago, and I think I'm going to turn it into a bonsai addict and fill my, fill my house full of bonsai trees. It's terrible. Um, so, you know, if, if you want to sell bonsai tree related accessories, make sure you're passionate about bonsai trees, right? Or at least someone in your organization is. That's really, really important. For me, what's more important than trying to game the system and game, game whatever platform you're on, whether it's Amazon or Allegro, what's more important is building a legitimate brand and building the audience first. So go build an audience in Facebook groups, on Instagram, on TikTok, in Reddit forums before you launch potentially do a Kickstarter campaign, get these people interested in becoming part of your tribe and then launch your brand. And, you know, there's a great book on this topic. It's called 12 Months to a Million Dollars by Ryan Daniel Moran. Um, I wish I'd written it. It's basically what I did with Beast Gear. Uh, and then he went and wrote a book about it. Uh, I, do, I get nothing for saying that. I'm not an affiliate. I just really like the book. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And uh, Ben, thanks again. Pleasure. And good thanks luck in your me. business. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheers. Take care. Bye. And uh, of course, uh, before you go, click like and subscribe below. And now I would like to invite you to watch other video where our guest Dan Falco from a deaf device agency, he is sharing his story, how he sold his business, Amazon business. And uh, maybe you will learn a few more tips about selling your own Amazon business.